Hey everybody, welcome to part two in a series of videos for 504. Now 504 is a very unique game, so for me to do a tutorial video for the game is going to be pretty complex. For the simple fact that you're looking at 504 different games, hence the name of the game. And I'm sure nobody wants to sit around for a 10 hour video while I explain to you exactly how all the different worlds interact, especially depending on which slot they're in, or as the game refers to it as top. And there's nine different mechanics, they can go on three different tops or three different slots. You can do the math and figure out that there's 504 different kinds of games in this one box. And I know nobody wants to sit around for that complete tutorial. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to set up the game, basically show you exactly how everything works, and give you a rough overview of everything that's pretty much 100% complete for every single game of 504 you play. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take all these randomizer cards, I'm going to shuffle them up and I'm going to choose three different modules and I'm going to play three different games using those three different modules to show you how all these mechanics come together to complete the game of 504. Uh, it's a little bit different way of doing things than I normally do. Normally I do a complete tutorial, but again, it's going to be impossible here. And I think this is something that a lot of you will enjoy a lot more, just seeing exactly how all these different mechanics seem to work together. Now, to play 504, the basic thing you need to understand is 504 is based on the Book of Worlds. Now, the Book of Worlds is a fancy way of saying a different way to play the game every time you play it. Because, as I said, there are nine different mechanics, and the mechanics for the game is you have your pick up and deliver mechanic, you have your race type of mechanic, you have your mechanic where you need to be exploring the world, you have your mechanic when you're out there trying to build worlds, you have your majorities mechanic, you have your mechanic where you're trying to build factories and plants, you have your warfare mechanic, and you have your other half of the plants and your factory mechanic, and then finally you have your stock market mechanic. And again, you're going to pick only three of these mechanics, and depending on which slot that mechanic happens to fall in, is going to change exactly how the game of 504 plays. Basically, every single mechanic, depending on slot, is going to change things up quite a bit. Because whatever mechanic happens to be in slot number one, or top number one is the game that I like to call it, is going to judge exactly how the game is going to come to an end. It's also going to judge how you're going to score the victory points at the end of the game. Whichever mechanic you have in slot number two, or top number two as the game calls it, is going to judge exactly how you're going to earn your income. But there's one slight caveat to that because the ninth mechanic, the shares mechanic, does change it up because no matter what slot this one is in, it's always going to affect the game end and the final score. And you can see that through the book right here, that the ninth mechanic, no matter which slot it happens to be in, always affects your income, always affects your game end and your final scoring, and that's just the power of the mechanic for going out there for the shares. So that's one little caveat to that. Just want to share that really, really quickly before I forget. Pardon the pun of sharing the shares mechanic. Anyways, the second slot is going to generally decide your income. And finally, your third mechanic is going to add a little bit of flavor, change things up, and decide exactly what's going to change the basic of the top two mechanics. So just to take a perfectly random example here, we have this mechanic, which is a race type of game where players are racing against each other. That's our main mechanic. It's going to tell us how the game is going to come to an end. It's also going to tell us how we're going to earn our victory points at the end of the game. And then since we're adding exploring into the game, exploring is going to tell us how we're going to earn income. And if we read right here, it's going to tell us how our income is going to be earned. And then we can just add a little bit of extra flavor to the game by having maybe a pick up and deliver mechanic. But maybe we don't like pick up and deliver mechanics because we're just not a fan of pick and deliver. Maybe we like a little bit more of an aggressive game. Maybe we're kind of players who just like to see how in the face we can get with other players. So maybe you may drop that pick up and deliver mechanic and go ahead and throw in a warfare mechanic where players are actually allowed to attack each other and start working to conquer the map because we're playing across a map in that particular world. Or perhaps you don't like being aggressive, you don't like attacking other players, so maybe you're going to drop the warfare mechanic and maybe you'll make a world where players need to be race and explore and they need to find all these different locations that have different resources to start producing all these different things they're going to need and that's going to help them win the game. So the cool interesting thing about 504 and the biggest thing you need to understand is you need to figure out exactly what kind of game you want to play when you play 504. Two different ways you can do it. You can just simply decide as a group it is a two to four player game and it does play very well all the way from two to four players. The time it's going to take to play is going to be based on whatever modules you decide to pick. But the average play time is going to be as minimal as 45 minutes, and probably the longest you're going to take is probably going to be a two-hour game, especially when you start throwing shares in the mix. But a lot of these modules can be done in about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. That's pretty much the average. You're looking at about 75 minutes tops for most of these modules. 
The other way we can decide what kind of world we want to play is by using the module cards themselves. And this is probably one of the more interesting ways to do this. And I foresee this actually becoming the more popular version as people start becoming more familiar with 504, start understanding all the mechanics and understanding how the game plays and start realizing the pure, the really coolest thing about 504 is the fact that if you really have a game night where nobody can decide what kind of game they can play, you're basically going to pull out 504 and just let the whims of fate decide what kind of game you want to play. And you're simply just going to shuffle these cards out and deal them out, and that's going to decide exactly which one of three different worlds you can go ahead and play. And you're basically going to look at all your three answers and decide which kind of world seems like the most fun for you. So you can play World 926, which is going to be a shares game where you're racing and trying to create roads, which sounds very unique and is definitely a world I've never played. You can have a world where you're trying to have production, you're trying to have trying to get your factories going, and you're having a little bit of warfare, kind of making things a little bit more difficult. Or finally, you can have a world where you're trying to pick up and deliver resources, but the world has not been explored yet, so you need to explore the world while you're trying to work on majorities across the majority board, and that's going to add a little bit of variety to the game. So that's the other way you can figure out exactly how you want to play 504. And again, I think once people start becoming much more familiar with the game, it's probably going to become a much more popular way for people to play the game. At least that's the way it's starting to become for me because I just like the randomness. I like the variety. I like how it changes things up because you never know quite what kind of game you're going to enjoy, what kind of game you're going to explore, and what kind of experience you're going to have with 504. So now that you understand the Book of Worlds and how important it is, there's a couple other things we need to understand on when we play 504. The first biggest thing we need to understand is that top one, top two, and top three are very, very important. And they're called top one, top two, and top three for a very important reason. Because if there's ever a conflict in the rules for any reason, the module in the top slot, the higher slot, is the one that's going to take priority. So if we ever have a world where we're going to have some rules set down in module number two, but module number one says things will be done a little bit differently, module number one is always going to win out. The other thing we need to understand is that almost in every single game of 504 we're going to play, we're always going to have our resonance that we're going to use to do various things. And I'm grabbing the neutral resonance there, so pardon that. The player colors are green, blue, white, and purple. This is for extra using the shares and various other things. And then you have red, which is used when we do the warfare module. But I'll explain that when we get to that point. But every single player is going to pretty much in all but 38 different games out of 504, they're always going to use the resonance. Now, the way you find out if you're going to have a game that's not going to have resonance is you can look at the Book of Worlds, you're going to see the solid block line. So if I flip over one of the modules, you're going to see the solid block line again. But if I flip it over enough times, we may run into an instance where that solid black line is not going to be across all the modules. Now, if we ever have a module or a world, I should say, where that solid block line does not go across all three of the modules, then that means that that world is going to use resonance. But if you ever have the book of worlds showing that there is a solid black line and it's covering all three of the modules, this is going to be a world where resonance are not going to be used at all. And again, there's only 38 different worlds where this can happen. It's not going to happen too often, but that's one of the things that can happen if you see a solid black line going across all three of the modules. You know, this is going to be a world that does not use resonance. But there are things that's consistent to every single world. Every single player is always going to have a headquarters, and that's going to be in their player color, and it's going to be a star, and that's for every single player. Every single player is also going to have settlements, and these are the square disks right here. These components are made out of wood. I'm going to call them disc just because it works for me to say that. But these are the settlements. And every single player is always going to use settlements. So that's something that's going to be used in 100% of the worlds. So it's always going to be used. The next thing that's always going to be used every time you play 504 is the money. Every single game uses money. And finally, every single game is going to be using these map tiles. Now, the way you figure out exactly which kind of map you're going to use and what kind of layout you're going to have is going to be based on what worlds you've picked and that's going to tell you exactly what kind of map layout you're going to have. It's either going to be a large map that's going to be pre-built, or it's going to be a smaller map that's pre-built, or maybe it may be a 100% random map that you're going to play and build up differently every single time you play the game. Now, to find out what kind of map you're going to use, you're simply going to look at every single one of these modules, and all these modules are going to use Roman numerals. We want to get the smallest Roman numeral, so Roman numeral 1 is more important than Roman, Roman numeral number 2 all the way down to Roman numeral 4, for example. So if we have in this example, this world is world 2, 5, and looks like we got five, 1. So world 251 is the world of res restless explorers on journeys. They add that in just for a little bit of theme and just to give you a little bit of smile on your face to add a little theme to the game here. 
but we're going to see in the upper left hand corner it's going to show us exactly which kind of map we're going to use. Now again there's a little bit of conflict so we need to use a smaller Roman numeral. Again the only time the upper one is going to break any ties is if there's ties between them but there's a lower number that's the one we're going to pick. So we see that this world right here says we use map number or map number five its priority is Roman numeral number four. This one says that we're going to use map number one its priority is Roman numeral number one so one trumps four so we know that we're probably using this map so we go ahead and look at the third module which says that also priority four we're going to use map number five. So this is priority four, priority four, priority one. We know that one is a lower number than the other two so we know that this is the map we're going to use. So once we find out what map we're going to use we simply pull out the main rule book and we're going to turn to the section on the map and it's going to tell us exactly which map we're going to be using for this world for this game that we're playing. So we're using map one and it says we have different capitals except for the center city. So now we look at that and we need to figure out exactly what this means by looking at these different map possibilities that we can have. And now since we see that we're going to have map number one which is going to be our priority we're going to look at map number one. Again it's map one, map two, map three, map number four all the way down here. Don't get confused. I know it kind of hides there. Then finally a map number five. So since map number one is going to have priority, we're going to see that we're going to pick one of these maps. And this one in a specific case says we're going to pick a different map based on the player number. So in a two-player game, it's going to be this map right here. In a three-player game, we're going to use this map. And finally, in a four-player game, that's the map we're going to do. And we're simply going to take these tiles and we're going to build the starting map. Now since we're also using the world of exploring, we know that we're going to start using more tiles beyond that. So we don't need to put the extra tiles away in the box. Now you're also going to notice that a lot of these tiles are all double-sided. You have the mountain tile, which is just showing mountain on one side. On the other side, it's going to show a mountain with some ore. You have your fields, which is going to show grain on one side and just fields on the other. You have a forest, which shows your wood. You have your grasslands, which shows your cows. You have your water, which is where the boat comes from. This is a very, very important tile. I'll explain it to you later, but you cannot play the game without the boat. Highly, highly important. Then after the water, you're going to see that you have fish on the other side. Then you're going to have your cities. On one side it's going to be just a blank city with a number anywhere from 1 to 10. On the other side you're going to have a whole bunch of different resources along with the city number. Now the way this is going to work and this is a little bit different for the cities that are a little bit different than the other tiles is this is going to show this is the resource that the city produces and this is only going to be important when you have worlds where you're trying to deliver goods to other cities but this is the resource that this city produces. These are the resources that this city wants and you're going to notice that every single one of the cities is just ever so slightly different about what they produce and what kind of resources that specific city wants. And you also have to make sure that when you're building these maps you put the cities on the exact same locations that it actually tells you to. So city number one is going to go in the center here, city two, city three. In a three player game we see city one, two, three, and four. And finally in a four player game we see city number one, city number two, three, and four. You always have to put the water tiles there, the grass tiles, but you always have to build the map exactly the way it says. Now for most of the maps when you build them it's not really going to matter which side of these tiles you have face up unless it specifically tells you in the book of worlds that you need to have them face up with the resources or not. And for the most part the only ones that you're going to need the resource side up for the general tiles is going to be the production worlds and the only ones you're going to need the city sides up for pretty much is going to be a lot of the pickup and deliver but that's not a hard and fast rule don't say that's going to be 100% working all the time. But for the most part you generally don't need to worry about what side of these tiles is face up. But if you want to worry about it and you don't want to make a mistake the first couple times you're playing the game, then just simply have all the tiles face up. And you're going to see it's a lot of wasted information, but at least you won't make that mistake and have to worry about that. But again, it's going to tell you pretty much in the book of worlds whether you need to have the tiles face up or face down. It really doesn't matter. Once you've decided on your world, what kind of world you're going to have, the next thing you need to figure out is going to figure out what kind of player order is going to happen. And this is going to be very, very important because when you're playing the game, the player order, the way the player order is going to happen every turn is going to decide if you're going to have a game where you're playing five different phases every time you play the game or if you're only going to be playing phase number three every time you play the game. And I know that sounds very strange, but that's all going to be based on this section right here of the Book of Worlds. Every one of these Book of Worlds is going to tell you exactly how player order is going to happen. If it tells you that player order is always going to be in clockwise order, and remember it's going to tell you by priority, so priority four is less important than a priority three. So if we were to flip the maps, we would go over perhaps over here to the world of shares. We're going to see that priority four, priority two, priority four. Priority four says clockwise play order. This one says clockwise play order. This one is two, so this is going to take priority. And this is going to be round based company order, which is going to change your player order. But the different ways these player orders is going to decide exactly 
what kind of phases you're going to play every single time you play the game. If you're having a clockwise order when you're playing the game, again, you can ignore phase one. You can ignore a lot of the phases, but if you're playing a game where the player order changes, you need to start throwing a lot of these phases back in. For example, if you have a game where you have privileges, where you're allowed to buy privileges when you play the game, and it's a game where the turn order is always going to be played in clockwise order, you're simply going to ignore phase one, and then you can play phase two where players get to purchase their privileges. Then you can go on to phase three where players are going to take actions, whether it's actions with their transport unit, take actions with their residents who are going to go across the board and do various things. And then finally you're going to move over to where you're going to deal with factories if you happen to have them, possibly deal with warfare, deal with your income, and then you're going to possibly pay dividends if you have a world that involves dividends. If you don't, you're going to completely ignore phase number four. Then finally you're going to have phase five, which is going to be your scoring and your final scoring, which is only going to matter at the end of the game. So looking at the world we have out here, just as a perfect example, we're going to see that we're dealing with a world that is 2, 5, 1. It's going to be clockwise player order, so we know since it's clockwise player order, we can completely ignore phase number 1 in this world. And this is really going to be the hardest part about explaining how to play 504, and the main reason why you got to make sure you always have the book of worlds at hand, especially when you learn how to play the game, and also do a little bit of you know, pre-reading, check out all the rules, and figure out everything that's going to be involved in the game. Because all these phases, if those components are not involved in the game, you're basically going to completely ignore those phases. So we have this world right here, the sample world of 251. There's no privileges involved. There's no random player order that's going to change, so we can completely bypass phase one and bypass phase two every single time we play the game. Well, let's say we happen to drop out the pickup and deliver aspect, and we decide that we want a world of racing, exploring, and having privileges. So now that we have this world, we see that the player order has not changed, so we can still bypass phase number one completely. We don't need to worry about it. But we have now have added privileges into the game, and since we've added privileges in the game, we can't ignore phase number two. But if we don't use this module at all, we don't use this world at all, and we go back to our other world where we're doing pick up and deliver, we know that we can completely ignore phase number two, and then we're going to move over to phase number three. And if any of these resources are involved in the game in that specific section, we're going to do that part of the phase in pretty much the order it lists here. But if those instances or those things, those items are not involved, we're going to simply bypass them completely. We're going to completely ignore them and move on to the next phase. So in this world, 251, we're going to see that the first thing we could do is we could change the capital, which is going to be a possibility because we see that top number two is involved. Or I'm sorry, module number two is involved in top one. And this number right here shows module number two. And since module number two is involved, we know this phase is definitely going to occur because it's involved in the game. Whereas opposed, we see that phase two privileges, it only shows that if module of privileges is involved in a world or involved in this world in slot top one or slot top two, we know that this phase is going to occur. But if that example I just showed you a minute ago, that was actually a bad example because that actually would not happen. If we looked right here, we see that the module number three is not involved in the slots one or slots two, so it's actually not going to happen. So a better example to show you instead of that would have been to show you if we change up the world just a little bit and we have world number 231, we would see that now since module number two is in slot number one or slot number two, we're definitely going to have that phase. So this is basically how we're going to decide exactly how the phases occur, which phases are going to occur, when they're going to occur, and how we're going to play the game. And again, it's the most complex part about the game. It'll become much, much easier the more you play the game, but just realize that if one of these numbers are not involved, for example, if we're not using module 7, we're going to ignore this. If we're not using module 9, we're going to ignore this. If we're not using module number 2, we're going to ignore this. If we're not using module number 4 in top number 3, specifically top number 3, we're going to ignore this. If module number 8 is not involved in top 1 or top 2, we're going to ignore that. And you're basically going to go through, and that's how you're going to play the entire game of 504. After you've built your map and figure out exactly how player order is going to occur and figure out exactly which kind of phases are going to occur during the game, next thing we need to do is we need to figure out exactly which kind of components we need to add to the game to play the game. Anything not listed on the components list is pretty much going to be put back in the box you can pretty much ignore at this point. So we're going to start basically from top to bottom and look at all the items and it's going to tell us exactly what we need. For example, we know that if the world of restless people, the race module, is in slot number one, we need to have the 10 city cards added to the game. So we need to go through all the components find the 10 city cards and grab them. We know that's going to be part of this game. 
And then we're also going to read the next part. It's going to say that there happens to be a world with no resonance. And we see that's the fact because we have the solid black line going across all three modules. We're going to read across and it's going to give us some extra special instructions. Now normally we're going to see that we don't use any resonance because of the solid black line. But it's going to break that rule and tell us that we actually have to get 10 resonance for each player. So every player is going to indeed, matter of fact, going to get 10 resonance in their player color. So they're going to be used a little bit differently than how normal resonance are used. And it's going to tell you in the rules over on this side. Let's not jump ahead here. just want to continue explaining this. Then we're going to continue going down looking at everything we need. It's going to say that we need the six Explorer tiles. So we're simply going to grab the Explorer tiles. We're going to see that we need to get one die. Grab that. We're going to see that we're going to need the income tokens. We simply grab all the income tokens. It's going to be another component we're going to need to play the game. Next thing we're going to see is that we're going to need the transport trolley. So every single player is going to need one of the transport trolleys in their color. Next thing we're going to need is we're going to need the cargo hold card. So we're going to look at all the cards, find the cargo hold cards. Every single player needs to make sure they grab one of those. And we're simply just going to continue grabbing all the resources, all the components that the game tells us to add. And any component that's not on the list for these three modules, we simply just place back in the box and we're done and we're ready to pretty much start the game. So the world of Restless Explorers will look something like this. And in this pretty unique world that I've never experienced before, from what I'm reading, basically all the players would have their transport trolleys. They'd each start with one of their transport trolleys in their starting city. And the objective of the game would be to take your residents and transport them from their current cities and deliver them to the other cities. The first person to explore, find the cities, transport the residents to the cities and get the first person based on the player count to explore a certain amount of cities and deliver a certain amount of residents will be the winner of the game. And then you're going to figure out the victory points and you're going to get income based on exploration. The world's going to be different every time you explore it because it's going to be based on the random roll of the die, which is going to decide which kind of tiles are going to start appearing on various locations as you go out there and you explore the world and start learning what kind of world which one 251 happens to be. So that's basically how 504 would work on some of these sample worlds. Now there's just a couple of specific rules that are constant for all the games, for all the worlds, and these are rules that are always in effect no matter which one of the worlds you happen to be playing. The first rule that is constant to 504 and is going to be in effect every single time you play the game is that every single player is going to start with a basic income, and this is going to be based on however many players you're playing and which world is going to take dominance. You're basically going to look at every single one of these, figure out which one of these Roman numerals is going to be the least, and it's going to tell you exactly how much income every single player is going to start the game with. And again, how much income you're going to be making every single round is going to be based on whatever module happens to be in top number two. Again, unless you play the shares rule or the shares module, which changes things up just a little bit. All but 38 of the worlds use residence and the amount of residence that every single player is going to start the game with. And again, this only matters if this is a game that uses residence. But the game is going to have, if it's a two-player game, every player is going to start with 30 residence. If it happens to be a three-player game, every player is going to start with 25 residents. And if it's a four-player game, every single player starts with 20 residents. The only difference here is if you're playing with a world that uses shares, module number nine and slot, or top number one or top number two, then every single player is going to start with exactly 15 residents, no matter how many players happen to be playing the game. Of course, if you happen to be playing one of the worlds that does not use residents, such as world 251, it's going to tell you exactly how many residents to use. And in this example, you're going to start with exactly 10 residents. That's all the residents you're going to use for the entire game. The rest of the residents are going to be removed and they're not going to be used at all. Every single world in the game is going to use a sediment and every one of these games is going to use the amount of sediments based on the player count. That is, if this is a world that also uses residents. So if it's a world that uses residents, every player is going to get the amount of sediments equal to the amount of residents they happen to have, unless of course you're playing with a world without residents. If that's the case, every single player is only going to get 20 sediments. And if you're playing with a world with the shares module, it's module number nine and top one or top number two, every single player gets 15 sediments, whether there's a residence or not involved in the game. Every single player is also going to get a headquarters, and this goes for every single player. They're going to put their headquarters on their starting city, unless it's one of those worlds that tells them not to, but most of the worlds are going to have you place your, your headquarters in your starting city. And one important thing to realize, especially when you're talking about the warfare module, module number four, is that your capital and your sediments also happen to count for each other. And you can never have a sediment of your color in the same location, same tile, as your current headquarters. So if you have your headquarters here, you can't build a sediment in the same location. It's not allowed. And also in modules without war, you can have multiple sediments of different colors in the same location. 
as long as you don't um, violate the rule about having a settlement of your color in the same location as your capital. But if you're playing with a module of war, only one player can have a settlement of their color in a certain tile. If more than one player tries to place a settlement of their color in a tile's location, those players are going to go to war based on the residents fighting each other. Every single game, as I've already mentioned, is going to use money. Every single game is going to judge the game end and the victory conditions, the victory point conditions, based on whatever module happens to be in top number one, again, unless you're using the module shares, which breaks that rule. Every single module in slot number two is going to tell you exactly how you're going to do your income, again, unless you're using the shares module. And finally, every module down in slot top number three is going to add a little bit of flavor and change of the gameplay just a little bit. In the game, all players are always going to get the same amount of turns. So if we're playing a game and this player brings about the end game victory condition, all the other players are also going to get the chance to take their turn on that turn unless we happen to be playing one of the military modules and the military module happens to be involved in the game of 504. If there is a military module involved and the victory condition is brought in, that's actually going to end the game immediately at the end of that player who brought the end game condition as soon as that happens. They're going to actually end the game and then we're going to add up all the victory points. Your headquarters and your settlements can never be moved unless you're playing with a warfare module. That means that somebody's module or settlement is actually removed from the board because they're destroyed. But remember, only settlements can be destroyed if the module of warfare happens to be included. And an opponent's headquarters can only be destroyed if warfare happens to be in the top slot number one. If you're in module warfare is in slot two or slot three, Headquarters cannot be destroyed of your opponents. In modules that use residents, players are going to use their residents to perform various actions, whether it's building roads, building different buildings, building various things across the board. But there's a couple rules you have to respond and listen to when you're dealing with residents. First of all, if a resident is currently standing up, they are considered active. Once a resident does an action, they need to be laid down on their side to show they've been exhausted. Residents are never allowed to enter any water spaces, so if you want to move around and avoid water spaces, especially on a world that requires exploration, you need to start exploring different locations and start moving those locations. Doing the explore action is usually going to exhaust the resident or possibly remove the resident from the board, and anytime one of your residents enters a new tile where you currently do not have a settlement, that resident is going to be removed and they're going to turn immediately into a settlement as part of that action to move in that new location. Also, when you're buying extra residents, all residents in games that use residents always cost $10 a piece to buy, and then it'll be purchased during the phase, phase 3C, and that's when you get your chance to purchase all your residents, and they always cost exactly $10. Residents are going to come into play when you buy them, they're going to come into play active, but there is a limit to the amount of residents you can ever buy at one time on a single tile, and the maximum amount of residents of your color that can ever be on a tile itself. The max amount of residents you can ever buy or have on a tile with your capital happens to be nine. So if you have zero residents on your capital, you can buy nine residents at the same time and you can place them all on your tile as long as you have the money to afford them. Remember, they're going to cost you $10 a piece, but you can buy up to nine even if you don't have any residents on your capital tile, which goes to show you that it's going to be pretty darn hard to defeat another player by completely wiping out their capital. But again, you can have a maximum of nine residents of your color on your capital tile. The max amount of residents that you can have on any tile with one of your settlements is seven, but the max amount of residents you could ever buy at one time on your tile with your settlement is based on the amount of wooden pieces you currently have on that tile, not including your trolley. So if you happen to have this tile right here and I want to buy residents and add them to this tile, the max amount of residents I can add to this tile is one because I only have one piece of wood currently on that tile. On a future turn, now that I have two pieces of wood, one resident and one settlement, on a future turn, I can buy two residents and add them to that tile. On another turn, now that we have four pieces on that tile, I could technically buy four more and I can add them to the tile and I'd be okay there because you reach the maximum of seven residents on a tile. But let's say, for example, we only have five residents on this tile right now and we have one settlement there already. I can't buy six more residents since I have six pieces of wood because there's a maximum of seven residents of your color allowed on your tile where you have your settlements. Again, your capital can have up to nine residents. You can buy as many as you want at a time and place them there. Your settlements can only have a maximum of seven of your residents there. And remember, you can only buy as many per turn as the current amount of wooden pieces you currently have on that location, not including your trolley. Finally, like I said, all residents come into play active and ready to perform actions. But any residents you don't use by the end of phase 3D are going to be exhausted. So any residents you don't have performing actions such as building roads, 
such as going out there exploring, such as turning into residents by exploring other locations. Any residents that you don't actively use are all going to be exhausted after the end of your turn. So residents you buy are going to come into play refreshed. Residents you don't use and residents you perform actions with are all going to be exhausted. And you show they're exhausted by simply laying them on their side. And of course, all residents are allowed to do only one action. Once they do that one singular action, whatever that may be, whether it's building roads, building sediments, exploring other tiles, or whatever you may have them do, building plants, building factories, searching locations for victory points, searching locations for resources, anytime you do that, you're simply going to lay them on their side to show they performed an action and now they are now exhausted. All players are also going to get income during the phase 3H. And remember, every single player is going to get income based on the rules of the game, plus a base income of 20 for having your capital. So as long as you have your capital, you're always going to get base income of $20 plus any bonuses the game tells you to get from various actions such as exploring, such as doing various things to gain and increase your income level. There's only one other important rule to understand about 504 and that's that players are never ever allowed to trade resources with other players of any kind. You can trade money, you can trade any kind of resources you've collected or anything among other players. That's one of the modules that's missing from the game is that's their module of trading. So that's one thing you can't do. So now I hope you enjoyed this tutorial video. I know it's been kind of a little bit brief because this is a game of 504 different games and it really would be difficult for me to go through and explain to you all those different games and how to play all those games. So I try to give you a rough overview of how all these different modules work. What I am going to do now is I'm just going to simply draw out three different modules and we're going to flip these modules over and we're going to figure out exactly which kind of worlds we're going to play through in my sample gameplay videos. So it looks like the modules we are going to have for our playthrough videos is we're going to have the module of roads. Should be interesting. We're on the module of warfare. Always a fun one. And finally, we're going to have the module of exploration. Actually, another module I really, really enjoy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean everything up and I'm going to set everything up and I'm going to organize the game. I'm going to play through three times using these three modules. And I think just for simplicity so I don't lose my mind, we'll play four, five, six first. Then the second module we're going to play is we're going to play five, 64. And then finally, I think what we'll do is we'll just do... How about we do 645 as the final module? Hopefully I will remember that. If not, you guys can all make fun of me. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial video for 504. If you have any comments or questions, as always, leave them in the YouTube comments down below. You can also feel free to email me at off the shelf board game reviews. That's OTSBGR at gmail.com. As always, if you enjoyed this video series, click that like button, click that subscribe button. As always, thanks for watching.